This is Roger Buck here, and today we're just going to read the first chapter of my book, The Gentle Traditionalist. It's a novel about a mysterious old man in Ireland called G.T. Unsurprisingly, G.T. stands for The Gentle Traditionalist. And we're just going to dive in, start reading chapter one, uh, although afterwards I hope to say a few rather more personal, hopefully interesting things at the end of the video. Here we go with chapter one, opening notes. G. P. L. Those are my initials. You'll hear my full name later, but let's start with those. G. T. The gentle traditionalist would like it that way, I think. You'll hear his real name soon, too. This book isn't mine, you see. It's G.T.'s. Without him and what he did for me, I could never have written it. I call it a book, but really, I'm not sure it is a book. Not in the ordinary sense, anyway. I'll be frank with you. I'm not much of a writer. These are just some notes. Hopefully, they give you the minimum you need to make sense of my story. That story starts in Ireland. Monaghan in the north, to be precise. Although I come from Winchester, in England. Went to Cambridge University and work in London. I'm 29 years old and I'd never been to Ireland before. Now, it wasn't that I was especially interested in Ireland. It was she. She loved Ireland. And I couldn't help myself. I loved her. I always loved her. I know it sounds corny. But honestly, I think I loved her from the moment we met. It will sound even more corny when I tell you we met on Valentine's Day. I met my true love on Valentine's Day, and later I lost her on Valentine's Day. Cue the sad sound of violins. But I can't help it. Corny or not, it's true. And as you'll see, it's important to my story. Anna O'Neill is her name. With a name like that, you might think Anna was Irish. But she was English. Only her father came from Ireland. She'd grown up in Liverpool, but was working as a stenographer in Cambridge when I met her. Later, we lived together in London. She always drove me crazy, in more ways than one. Our relationship finished when Anna said she needed a year to find herself. She had had an inheritance which allowed her to quit the stenography. She then took off for some new age community in Scotland where they talked to giant cabbages or something. But she didn't come back as she promised. She went to Oroville in India then Ojai and Esalen in California. It went on two years, then three, four, five. She was having adventures all over the world. Or misadventures. She wrote me emails about burning her feet on hot coals while firewalking in Hawaii. And she got hypothermia with Yogi Starbear, a Native American shaman, during a vision quest in Yellowstone National Park. I also found some time to travel. I went to Africa. What I saw appalled me. It literally gave me nightmares. Maybe I should tell you up front. I'm pretty left-wing. To me, 
it's transparently obvious global capitalism has a great deal to answer for. And after Africa, I meant to do something practical about it. By contrast, I couldn't help but judge Anna as completely impractical, frivolous even. Neither of us started any new relationships in this time. I trust Anna implicitly in that. In her emails, she always said she still loved me, but that I shouldn't wait for her. We were just too incompatible. Our Mercuries were in conjunct, and mine was retrograde at birth. We were soulmates, she said, but doomed by the stars. One thing was certain. I never knew how to handle this New Age side to Anna. I always hoped she'd get over it. How could she believe all this stuff about star signs and cabbages? Not to mention karma, angels, and holistic frog licking. Okay, I lied about the last. Still, it tells you something about my sheer frustration with this nutty side of her. She even changed her name to Lotus Flower for a few years. But finally, she returned to stay with a friend in London for a whole summer. She was different. She seemed less crazy, more ordinary somehow. And her name was back to Anna again. I felt relieved. Maybe all the New Age nonsense was over now. But then she dropped the bombshell. We could never be together, she told me. She had decided to take a vow of celibacy. Be a nun. My jaw fell open. A Buddhist nun? I asked. No, she said. Catholic, as in Roman Catholic. I couldn't believe my ears. Never in a billion years could I imagine Anna being Roman Catholic, let alone a Catholic nun. Moreover, she wouldn't be like one of these modern nuns who wear ordinary clothes. She was going full blast traditional. She'd found this convent of nuns in France called Les Religieuses Victimes du Sacre Coeur, the Religious Victims of the Sacred Heart. What a name! They were into the Mass in Latin. And they were strict. She would wear a habit, a veil, the whole bit. Anna was stunning. Talk about a waste. But it was more than that, of course. I was gutted. Beyond gutted. Gutted squared. Up to now, I really thought Anna and I would make it. Someday. Now, she seemed further away than ever, even if she weren't becoming a nun, much more now separated us than when she was simply a new ager. Before, we were both left-wing, and we shared the same basic liberal convictions. When Anna was a new ager, at least, she didn't think masturbation was a sin, or that some people went to hell. We both supported abortion, gay issues, stuff like that. We were socially inclusive. And if one thing united my own secular perspectives with her New Ageism, we both agreed organized religion was pretty old-fashioned, even stupid and bigoted. Now, Anna had suddenly developed 
this rigid intolerance. I really could not understand it. Yet I loved her, and somehow she looked more beautiful than ever. She had this new poise and developed this enigmatic smile. It was like the Mona Lisa, I thought. But Anna was far more beautiful than the Mona Lisa. And despite her newfound rigidity, Anna actually seemed less angry than in the past. Back then, she had quite a temper. She didn't suffer fools gladly and could explode at the drop of a hat. It was weird. Now she was gentler, softer, more tolerant, and yet intolerant at one and the same time. We still had fights, though, but Anna always apologised first, even when it was clearly my fault. Later, she went to confess it to her priest. Finally, at the end of that summer, she left for Marseille in France. I went to the airport with her. It was the worst day of my life. I thought she was gone forever. I didn't hear much from her after that. She was a novice, a trial nun, before making vows. Still, I guess she meant to break all her worldly ties. Then, one day at the start of February, everything changed again. I heard she wasn't in France, but staying in a big old farmhouse outside Monaghan in Ireland. I was elated. Had she dropped the Catholic thing now, just like the nutty New Age stuff? No, she told me on the phone. She was still Catholic. But she wasn't sure God was calling her to be a nun. She told me the farmhouse was big and cold and empty, apart from her. I told her I had two weeks leave coming. Next day, I caught a plane to Dublin and drove up to Monaghan. It was like old times, living under the same roof again. Except, of course, it was purely platonic. This gorgeous woman I loved, so near and yet so far, unbearably frustrating. Still, we talked. We talked like never before. Of course, we talked about her Catholicism. I tried to understand all her rigid rules. Or maybe I didn't try hard enough. Maybe I was too upset. I just wanted to protest. In any event, Anna would clam up rather than give me rational explanations why she believed the crazy things she did. It was always, the church teaches this, or the church declared that, back in the year 381 or something. It made me mad. How relevant was that today? And couldn't she think for herself? Occasionally, though, she did give reasons I could understand. We were talking about church teaching on hell. I said it sounded pretty dour, dire, awful. She said people were already in hell everywhere in this world. Drug pushers, killers, warmongers. Why should hell stop when you kick the bucket? Take Hitler, she said. If you were responsible for killing six million Jews, five million Poles, and millions more soldiers and civilians. Would you expect eternal happiness after you died? No, I objected. But Christianity also talks about hell being eternal. A million times, 
a million years is only the first nanosecond of your infinite torment. I wouldn't wish that on anybody, not even Hitler. I can't believe in a God who is less merciful than I am. Hell is a mystery, a terrible mystery, she replied. Apparently, St. John Paul II once said we cannot know for certain who will be in hell at the end of time, or indeed whether anyone will be in hell. On the other hand, better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. What's that supposed to mean, I said? It's Milton, she said. Satan, in Paradise Lost, perhaps a soul like Hitler's, prefers eternal hell to heaven. Like I said, hell is a mystery, unfathomable, terrible. Her voice trailed off. Then she added, we can't know what heaven or hell are really like. Not in this life. But if you believe in an afterlife, it doesn't make sense to just suppose everyone will be automatically happy when most people in this world are not happy. Somehow, I could buy this. This was why Catholics talked about purgatory and hell. Obviously, we live on a planet of incredible suffering everywhere. Why should the next world, if there was a next world, be automatically different? At any rate, I was never against the idea of an afterlife. Indeed, I believe there must be something afterwards. Life couldn't be that pointless. I just couldn't see strumming a harp for eternity, or being slowly roasted over a spit by the devil either. But if Hitler's soul was still around somewhere, I couldn't imagine he'd found eternal bliss. No, as GT was to show me. Anna and I did share some basic beliefs but I hardly realised this at the time. Still, I should be clear about this. I wasn't an atheist, or even an agnostic. I knew there had to be something out there. It just didn't look like a bearded old man in the clouds who turned himself into a baby to save me. I also didn't think the Catholic Church had some sort of monopoly on the truth. And I found Anna's attitudes towards the church completely contradictory. For one thing, she'd gone all the way to a Latin mass convent in Marseille because she couldn't bear the new liturgy. But now, in Monaghan, she went to an English mass every single day. There's no Latin Mass for miles around, she explained. Then why go to an English Mass if you don't like it? The Mass is the Mass is the Mass, she said. But you won't understand that unless you know what the Mass is. Christ is still present there, whether you like the liturgy or not. You mean, as something to eat, I scoffed. I told you, she said, you wouldn't understand. I didn't. Nor could I understand why she wanted to go to a mass in a dead language. From what I understood, the Catholic Church had changed the mass when it liberalised itself in the 1960s. This liberalisation looked like a good thing to me, but Anna thought the changes in the church 
were slowly killing it. Since the 1960s, she told me, there had been massive declines in vocations, as well as Catholic baptisms, marriages, etc. People were abandoning the church in droves. She was particularly worried that very few people bothered with the sacrament of confession anymore. The new liturgy, according to her, was a major part of the problem. Apparently, she said, a mystic life force was being drained from the church. Anna might be a Catholic now, but she still sounded like a nutty New Ager to me. Another point of tension between us was Ireland. She was thinking of settling down in Ireland even though the country had little in the way of the Latin Mass. Actually, Anna always had this thing about Ireland, so this wasn't entirely new. Like I said, her father was Irish. He came from County Cork. And as a kid, Anna went on holiday to her old grandmother in Cork. That grandmother had been very special to her, and her times in Cork were magical, a respite from an unhappy childhood in Liverpool. But now, her old love of Ireland was mixed up with her Catholicism, and a newfound Irish nationalism that frankly troubled me. She reeled out this version of history, whereby Catholic Ireland had long been oppressed by Protestant England, it was hard for me to take. Even if the British had been terrible at times, what was the point in stirring up these ancient hatreds? Staying near Monaghan, we were only a few miles from the border with Northern Ireland, whilst Anna deplored the terror inflicted by the provisional IRA. She considered that border a tragic thing, a horrendous gash across the country. Both North and South Desperately needed the other, she said. Cut off from each other, Ireland, according to her, could not fulfil her spiritual calling. Whatever that meant. I just didn't get it. At any rate, Anna might be half Irish on her father's side. But basically, she was English. She'd grown up there, like I did. Indeed, She'd always loved England, as did I. Her newfound criticisms of England grated on my nerves. Annoyingly, she also put down modern Ireland. Ireland, Anna said, had become too much like secular England or America. As recently as 1970, she told me, 90% of the Irish people still went to Mass every Sunday. It had dropped to something like a quarter in less than 50 years. For Anna, this was a tragedy. Also, since 1970, murder in Ireland had increased sixfold and suicide had grown by four times. Obviously, Anna linked the loss of faith to social unrest, even murder in modern Ireland. The nation had lost what made it special, she claimed, the Catholic Church. Apparently, it was all some Anglo-American plot to turn the country into part of the capitalist West. And weirdly, it was just the same with her old New Age stuff. Now, she really objected to holistic spirituality. She called it pagan. It wasn't really holistic, she said. It wasn't inclusive, but exclusive. Subtly, it worked to eliminate Christ and the cross 
from Western civilization. Much of it, she said, came from the East, but it was popularized by Anglo-American gimmicks, and now Ireland was falling for those same gimmicks. Listening to her, it all seemed like one gigantic conspiracy against the Catholic Church in Ireland. England, America, Freemasons, President Obama, Margaret Sanger, Gloria Steinem, Hollywood, the Rolling Stones, the CIA, Helena Blavatsky, the Dalai Lama, Yogi Bear, God knows what else, maybe the Loch Ness Monster for all I knew, they were all in it together to subvert Christ's church on earth. Arg. How could she take this crazy paranoid stuff seriously? Still, Ireland was starting to get to me, in a good way. The Monaghan people were friendly, sometimes astonishingly so. We broke down in Anna's old car one day. It was pouring with rain. I couldn't believe how many people stopped and helped us out. We got drenched, and while one old man worked on the engine, another couple invited us back to their home to dry ourselves off and have tea. The Irish people were like that, Anna said. Ireland possessed a strange magic, I had to admit, and maybe that Irish magic was now working on us. Because, although we fought, we also laughed a lot. In fact, I've told you the worst stuff. Because, you'll see, it's necessary to this story. But, honestly, for the most part, we were actually having a really good time during those two weeks. So good, in fact, I started to think crazy things. Or, maybe they weren't so crazy. I could see Anna still loved me, and God knew, if there was a God, I still loved her. Clearly, she was giving up the convent idea if she wanted to live in Ireland. There was no Latin mass convent in Ireland, and no way would Anna join a modern convent. What if I were willing to find a job in Ireland? Would Anna marry me? She could have her Catholic life here. I could have my secular life, now that Ireland wasn't so Catholic anymore. Heck, I'd even marry her in the church, if that's what she wanted. I see now I was deluding myself. But love is blind, as the old cliché goes. The two weeks were nearly up. Tomorrow would be our anniversary, Valentine's Day. I decided to go for broke, proposed to Anna. The night before was actually very special. We were completely connected, just like in the old days. Anna even held my hand while we sat before a big log fire in the farmhouse. She still loved me, I knew it. How could she say no? And that, my friends, is the end of chapter one. If you're interested, you can read chapter two at our site, link down below, where you'll see GPL goes on to see a mysterious sign. It's actually a wooden sign from a shop in the street that reads, the gentle traditionalist. Clarifications provided. Questions answered. Arguments asserted. All in the most gentle manner humanly possible. But if you want to read more, you may have to buy the book. Obviously, I hope you might consider that. It will not only support my work, but um, 
My publisher, the remarkable Angelica Press, publishing great books in these difficult times. But apart from supporting Angelico and me, I hope you will find it a good read. I know that many people have, as you can see from something like 40 reviews over at Amazon. And I hope I won't sound boastful if I also note the book was even optioned for a movie. I talk about that in episode 20. Honestly, I'm very proud of this book. It's a short book. It's compact. But still, I address things that seem most important to me. The Catholic mystery, which is also to say the universal mystery, where our Lord Jesus Christ died for every single one of us and brought us new life, indeed brought an entire new world into existence. So the book is about that unfathomable mystery. But it's also about how the secular world obscures that mystery. And as a convert, this is something that really concerns me. Because the secular world completely obscured this mystery for more than 30 years of my life, as indeed it does for many British people like myself. Although Ireland, Ireland, used to be different. The book is about that too, and my deep love for Ireland, where the roots of the Christian mystery, the Catholic mystery, are so, so deep. Anyway, as I've said in my books and videos, discovering the Catholic mystery made me human, much more human than I was before earlier in my life. And as I look out at this dehumanizing world, the only hope I have for true humanity, true humanness, lies here in the universal Catholic mystery. So all my books are about this. But in The Gentle Traditionalist, I managed to address these issues, as I say, in a more compact way, also a more popular and easy to read way. That said, I doubt I'll ever write um, as popular a book again. It's not that I couldn't, I think, if I really put my mind to it. No, instead, it's a matter of a very deep question. Namely, what should I put my mind to? Or, in other words, where should I be placing my talents? That's a profound question for all of us, I think. Where should we be placing our talents? Um, especially if we see the heartbreaking condition of secular civilization, and if we see the immense spiritual suffering of people all around us, drowning in materialism, stripped of hope, stripped of meaning, stripped of Christ. Now, some of you may have seen episode 22, where I speak about my experience recently in Paris, in the Cathedral of Notre Dame, just before she burned. And as you may know, Notre Dame, Our Lady of Paris, before she burned, was home to the relic of the crown of thorns of our Lord. And I was there in Notre Dame, venerating that relic, I went up to kiss the relic, or at least kiss the reliquy, and I experienced something very important for me at that moment. And I speak about this in episode 22. I won't repeat it all now, but at the core of that experience was a sense of wasting my talents and of not being serious enough. And right now, just for anyone who may be interested, I'm going to continue in this very personal way, just being very personal about myself. Right now, I'm writing another book. Not yet ready to tell you what it is, but I will say it's likely to be the least popular and possibly most obscure book I've written yet. No way is it going to be popular like The Gentle Traditionalist. 
And I've also been finding it very, very hard to write. Truly, like hard sweat. You could say it's taking blood, sweat and tears. I can also honestly say I didn't want to write the book. And I found myself hoping I never need to write a book like this again. Um, but why do I say I need to write such a book if I really don't want to and I know it's not going to be popular? Um, some people would say, if you think you could keep writing popular books, why not go for it? Try to reach as many people as you can. Um, alas, this argument is a quantitative argument. And there is nothing more superficial in this world than thinking in terms of quantities. Some of the time that's necessary, of course, but our modern world is obsessed with quantities, with measurements, with data, statistics, popularity. For me, especially after Notre Dame and the Crown of Thorns in Paris, if I'm really going to take that experience seriously, it's necessary to try to go deeper than that. In other words, it's necessary to pray, to be silent, and to be contemplative. Our modern world doesn't like that much either. Truly, the amount of hyper-stimulation in this world scares me. All this internet, social media, Facebook, bombarded by everything, 24-7. Now, some of these things can be good, of course, in certain times and places. But at the moment, I am painfully aware of how much they interrupt my own prayer, my own depths. I hope, since I've returned from my travels in France, that I've managed to go deeper into prayer. I think I'm a different person, actually. Now, I'm nearly finished with this very personal digression. I might add, I've placed it at the very end of this video, and I imagine many subscribers to this channel will never get to this point. However, there are a few of you that seem to really care about these videos, and you may be still listening at this point. And it was mainly with you in mind that I thought I'd venture these more personal comments, explain a little how I've changed since returning from France last year, explain also why I've been very, very incommunicado of late, neither putting out videos and being very, very slow in responding to people, good people. If I'm honest, I worry about that because there are good people, people filled with faith, who are moreover very kind and warm to me. All that really supports me and I am really grateful. At the same time, I am trying to stay offline as much as I possibly can. I am trying to be as contemplative as I possibly can. That's necessary both for this obscure, unpopular book I'm writing, but it's also necessary if I'm not to bury my talents in the sand, so to speak. Again, all of us need to find the way to best use our talents. Again, we are living in a time of terrible dehumanization, and each of us is called to use the talents our Lord has given us. Hopefully, that explains why I'm writing a book I didn't want to write, because in the depths of my prayer, I felt a call for this for maybe three or four years now, that this is where I could best use my talents. And now, after too much procrastination, I'm finally doing it. On another note, I actually don't like being so down on social media. Obviously, I'm speaking to you today through the miracle of social media. And I see many of you doing inspiring things on social media, things that are really inspiring, keeping the light on for Western civilization, so to speak. 
Sometimes I wish I could be more like you in this way. I think my books would be more successful if I were more active on things like Facebook or churning out more videos. Um, certainly the soulless supercomputers at YouTube reward those who can churn the videos out. The more frequently you produce, the more the soulless analytics favor and promote you. It's just one more example of where everywhere inhuman computerization, also inhuman modern capitalism is hustling us. Move fast, faster, faster. But in the depths of my prayer, I myself feel a need to move slowly, carefully, avoid the hustle, avoid hyperstimulation, even if it means I can't promote my work the way others do. And on a final personal note, I might add I've also been slowed down by different family crises this year caused by the virus, as indeed I know so, so many of you have as well. No more of that now. I will just repeat that my first book, The Gentle Traditionalist, addresses the main themes of my work on this channel in a very popular, easy to read format. My other books go deeper, including my latest book, the sequel, The Gentle Traditionalist Returns, which I'm also very happy with, even though it's a darker and probably more difficult book than the first one, reflecting my changes in recent years. I say it's a darker book, but I'll add it's also a book about hope. It's a book about angels and saints and how grace operates in our lives through the intercession of the saints and the angels. And I guess that reflects a deepening process of faith going on in me that I don't just know and feel that God loves us all, each and every one of us, that our Lord loves us, Our Lady loves us, but so too do the angels and the saints. Heaven is filled with the communion of the saints and the angels, and they do intercede for us. So that's the major theme of my new sequel, The Gentle Traditionalist Returns, which I guess reflects these personal processes in my life, because in, in many ways the book is maybe the most personal of my three books, the book that is most me. Anyway, you can read more about the book, indeed all my books, uh, at Amazon, and down below you'll find links to all three of them. So right now, I'm just going to say thank you friends for listening. Thank you for all your expressions of warmth and support, and may God greatly bless you and keep you safe in these trying times.